Good evening, everyone. Once again, thank you so very much for joining me this evening. My name is Lem Marsh, and uh, we have a little Bible study for you. It's the Word of God. We just get right into it. We read the Scriptures. We ask God to help us to understand. We ask the Holy Spirit God to be right here with us, inspire what we say, and, and help us with the meaning of what the Word says. Um, I always ask you to uh, get yourself a notebook and, 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 and a pencil, maybe your own Bibles, but, but uh, get yourself a notebook so you can take down the Scriptures so that way later on in the week you can take your own Bible and from those Scriptures ask God to help you to see in your own Bible. Read your own Bible to yourself and, and believe the Word that you see in your own Bible. So anyway... Uh, the last time, we're getting along pretty good here. We're in Romans 7, and so we're, we're making good progress. Uh, today, we're going to begin in Romans 7 and verse 12. Let's just go ahead and start out and read it. It says, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Now, he says the law is holy. Well, what makes something holy? What makes something holy? You know, if you, if you remember back in Genesis, and I'm not going to go back to it, but uh, you will remember that Moses had been uh, thrown away from the Egyptian, uh, the, the palace at, at Egypt, and he had gone out into the, oh, I think they call it the backside of the desert, which I don't know what that me exactly means, except it was probably the worst part of the desert. But anyway, there he was a shepherd for many years. Anyway, while he was there, he saw the burning bush up in a mountain on fire, but not burning up. So he climbed that mountain to see what that burning bush, what, what, what that meant, what it was. And when he got up there, you know, as he approached that bush, he heard the Lord say, Moses, take off your shoes or your sandals or, you know, the ground that you are walking on is holy ground. Well, what made it holy? Well, God's presence is what made it holy. Any other time, that ground wouldn't be holy, but God's presence at that moment in Moses' life at the burning bush, that ground was holy. So that's the same way here at the, at the law. The, the, uh, the law, is, it says it's holy, and the Ten Commandments are holy. Um, the thing about it is God gave it to mankind, but our human nature gives us problems in that we can't follow that law perfectly. And because we can't follow that law perfectly, then we earn death. So that's the reason Jesus Christ had to come and pay the price with his blood, forgive us of our sins, so that we could get back, we, we could be redeemed back to God in a, in a relationship with God. Okay, let's go on and read uh, verse... Uh, 13, verse 13, was then that which is good, he's talking about the Ten Commandments here, made death unto me, well, God forbid it says, but sin, that old human nature that we inherited from Adam, that, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, or the Ten Commandments, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. So, Paul is realizing that he was a sinful man. At his, this was at his, uh, uh, at his conversion, he realizes that he was a sinful man, more so than he thought he was. Uh, Romans 3 and verse 20, uh, the, law, the law is, well, I'll show you here. Let's just read it here. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And I always use the example of stealing. You know, the law says, thou shalt not steal. So if we go out and we steal, then we look at that law and it says, thou shalt not steal. Then we know we have broken that law and we have earned death according to what, what God says. You know, it's sinful. It's ugly. And, and, it, and it, as he says here, it is exceeding sinful. You know, and I hope you realize that uh, just as Paul did, we were just like this before we were converted. We were just like this. 
We were sinful. We just didn't realize it, but once we are converted, then we realize it. Verse 14, Romans 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, you know, it was, it's holy, it, it is God's mind, it's God's given law. But I am carnal. We're talking about here before conversion. Uh, sold under sin. Sold into what? Into slavery. We are a slave to that law, or rather to, to, to that uh, sin nature. We are a slave to that sin nature. It reigns in our lives. It rules us. And from Satan, Satan rules us through that. And, but the thing about it is, Jesus Christ came, paid the price, bought us back, redeemed us back. So uh, that's what we're into now. Now, the rest of the chapter here in chapter 7 is so very, very interesting. Uh, Paul tells us about his own experiences, and uh, they reflect ours. They reflect our experiences. Because once you become a converted believer then you will experience this every bit as much as Paul uh, uh, experienced it. And it's a struggle, and it's an internal struggle. It's an all-out, really, he calls it warfare. Paul calls it warfare. Uh, verse 15 of Romans 7, For that which I do, I allow not. So what he's saying here is, Oh, I do things that I, just, I don't, I don't want to do. For what I would, that do I not for what I hate, that do I. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I would, if I do that which I normally would not do, uh, because I'm a believer and I'm converted, I can sin unto the law that it is good. So he's talking about two different natures within us here. Um, we have to continually uh, once we are converted, and we and and we have, we realize this more than more than before we're converted. We realize it now, and so we have these two natures within us. One a the nature, the old Adamic nature that we inherited from our forefather Adam, the human nature that's in us that wants to sin, and then the, and then God's Holy Spirit coming in us and. Uh, like you would call the one the bad side and one the good side, if, if you will, whatever you want to call it. But we need to feed that good side. In order to continue to defeat that bad side, we need to feed that good side. Well, how do we do that? Well, the four, um, the four um, disciplines that, is a lot of, that a lot of, uh, of, of religions or beliefs, they have four disciplines. And, of course, the one is prayer. That's one discipline. Uh, and the second one is Bible study. And these things we probably, I recommend we do them every day. I recommend you that you pray every day. I recommend that you read the Bible every day. And if you can, more than just read it, study it a little bit every day. And then... And then uh, uh, meditation, meditation on God's word, meditate on, on, you know, if you're outside on the back porch or whatever, you can meditate on, on, on nature, God's creation. You can meditate on the birds or the trees and how intricately they are made and how powerful God is to have made such a thing. And, and then once in a while, every so often, it would not be a bad thing for you to fast, go without water and food for a period of time. Now, I'm not talking about days, months, or weeks, but, uh, uh, you know, 20, a 24-hour fast is a pretty good fast. It's a pretty, it's a pretty long fast. By the time, if you do a 24-hour fast and you dedicate it to God, that's a pretty long fast. Uh, I, I don't recommend any particular length of time, but... Uh, I do say that you, you need to go at least maybe 16, 18 hours because say you started out at 10 o'clock at night. Well, then you, you sleep through the night. So that first part is fairly easily. But then you get up in the morning. Well, then you miss breakfast. And you probably are starting to feel a little bit thirsty because the first thing you miss is water. And then you go on through maybe till, uh, till noon. And uh, now you've missed your lunch. 
And, and you're really starting to feel it then. So by that time, you know, that's, that's, that's uh, what is that? That's 12, 14 hours. And then you, if you go another couple or three or four hours, then you could end your fast and then eat, eat dinner and drink. drink. The first thing you want to do once you end your fast is to drink water. I mean, everybody wants a drink. That's that your thirst is. But a fast, what does it do? It gets you close to God because it helps you to realize just how much you depend on him. You couldn't last very many days without food and without water. You just could not last very long without food and without water. In fact, matter of fact, you could last longer without food than you could without water. So anyway, it helped. But these are, these are good things to do uh, to, to feed that good side. I mean, you can do service. You can do service in your church, in your local church. Uh, a lot of churches, they have uh, outreach programs. They have uh, 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 women's, uh, women's um, clubs or, or divisions in their church that, that help the poor. And they, then they have, they have fundraisers to, to help the women, to help the poor. So, and uh, here locally, we have the parish house. A lot of people volunteer for the parish house. But these are all good things. This is feeding the good side. And, you, you know, just visiting a friend in need, someone in need uh, that needs to be, uh, you know, talked to or counseled or whatever, just doing that. That's feeding the good side. So uh, let's notice here at Galatians 5 and in, uh, starting in verse 16. First, and read verse 16 and 17. Write it down in your notes there. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what I'm talking about. Feeding the good side, walking in the spirit. And then it says here in verse 17, for the flesh lusts us against the spirit. And that spirit is capitalized. So we're talking about the Holy Spirit. For the flesh lusts us against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. So here's that war, that internal struggle that we believing Christians have all the time. It's there all the time. Uh, verse 17 in Romans 7. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin, that old nature that dwells in me. That's what does it. It's not, I don't want to do it, but that old sin nature in me, it drives me to that. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You know, whenever you think about yourself as being, am I good or am I evil or whatever, if you say, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, well, that's true. But Jesus Christ says he sends the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts if we are converted believers. We are converted believers. That Holy Spirit is in our hearts. Jesus Christ is in our hearts that way. We are part of the body of Christ. That organization uh, on earth that is under Jesus Christ as the head. That is the body of Christ or the church. Well, that part of us, that's the good part of us. That's the good part, but that's a spiritual part, you see. And then it goes on and says, For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. You know, the how to perform that which is good. That's, that's what we're looking for. We, we want to look ahead to see what that is. And we're going to pick a little bit of that how we do this over in the next chapter, chapter 8. It's talking about the chapter 8 is, is a big chapter about the Holy Spirit. So we'll get more of that when we get over into chapter 8. But uh, continuing here in, uh, verse, in uh, chapter 7, verse 19, it says, For the good that I would... I do not, but the evil which I would uh, not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin. That nature that's in me, that dwells in me, that nature. And verse 21, I find then a law. Now, this is not talking about the Ten Commandment law or, or even the civil law or the law of the land or anything. It's just talking about a, this law as, a, as being a fact of life. It's just like uh, if you have a rock in your hand, 
if you have a rock in your hand and you're standing up and you turn it over and you drop the rock, well, what, what happens? Well, it's just a fact of life. It's going to fall to the ground. Just a fact of life. It happens. Um, but I, and that's what he's talking about here when he says, I find then a law that when I, uh, when I would do good, Eve was present with me. So the fact of life here is whenever I try to do good things, well, what's happened? Satan is right there. Satan is right there, and, it, and he tries to influence us the other way. So we have to have that protection against Satan. Pray for protection for yourself, and pray for protection for your friends and for those that you know are converted Christians as well, because we need that protection. God's Word says that Satan roams this earth like a roaring lion. Now, you have to picture that in your head. Like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, I don't know about you, but I would not want to be in a field where there is a roaring lion coming after me. I would not. So we need God's protection. We do. The moment we're converted, that old nature that we inherited from Adam... That human nature, the moment we're converted, it is crucified with Christ. God sees it that it is crucified with Christ. It is dead. It is dead. To God it is dead. But the problem is, to us, we still see it. You know, when, when, when we're converted, when we're converted, God, God forgives us our sins. As far as he, the heaven is above the earth, as far as the east is from the west. You know, I love that analogy. But, but um, what did I start to say? Uh, we have to fight that old human nature uh, because we still see it. Oh, that's what I started to say. God clothed us in righteousness. And when he clothed us in righteousness, when he looks at us from then on, he doesn't see us. He sees himself reflected. So he sees himself. So he does, but we still feel that whole nature in us. So that's why the struggle. That's why we still have to, to fight against it. Romans 7, verse 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Well, what's he talking about there? Well, he knows that the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and minds once we're converted. And Paul's saying he delights in that. And that Holy Spirit leads us in the way of the law. It leads us. It doesn't, it, it will lead us, it, it, it will not ever lead us to go over and steal from our neighbor or, or go over and kill our neighbor. It will never lead us to do that. So it will not lead us to break the Ten Commandment law. It is our guide. It is our lead. And we delight in that Holy Spirit being in our inward man. Verse 23, but I see another law or another fact of life in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You know, Paul, Paul is in a real quandary here. He is perplexed. You, know, you can imagine. He, he is in a, he is confused, really, when it, when it comes to this. Can he not ever get out from under this? Can we not ever get out from under this? We're, uh, we find ourselves, whenever we're in this, we kind of find ourselves, what we would say now, we're in between a rock and a hard place. Well, it's, it's just difficult. It's a difficult thing. And then in verse 24, he's finishing up here. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this, the body of this, of, of this death? So Paul realizes that he is, if, if he is not forgiven of this sin, if Christ hasn't, you know, would not have come and paid our price, then he, he doesn't have any recourse. No one is going to live. He, he, would, he would have died. Uh, and verse 25, I thank God. This is it. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. Basically, it's what it's saying. The law of God. And, and, and this is, this is Paul's referring here to the, to the overall law of God. All of God's principles. Not just the Ten Commandments, but all of them. Let's read one verse here in Galatians 5 and verse 1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, 
in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So if you'll remember back whenever we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, those believing Jews over in Judea who believed that Christ was the Messiah now, but they were still under the law. All right? They came over to these people in Galatia who were uh, recently converted, and they were trying to get them. They said, well, you have to obey the law. You have to be circumcised. You have to obey the Mosaic law in order to be saved. And then Paul had to go up, you, you remember, and, and meet with Peter and get that all straightened out. So, but we're not under the law. We're not under that old Mosaic law anymore. We have liberty in Jesus Christ, it says right there. Jesus Christ has made us free from that, from that law. And we're, we're not to be entangled again into that yoke of bondage, it says. That, that's what it was. It was a yoke of bondage. So, you know, in spite of our dilemma, in spite of Paul's dilemma there, in the last part there of, of uh, Romans 7, one thing we have to keep in mind, we are still in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is still in us if we are believing, converted Christians. So we just have to keep that, we just have to keep that in mind. Who are those that are in Christ Jesus? You know, we've constantly spoke of this all the way up through. And Paul goes more deeply about this uh, in, in Ephesians. And, and he's, uh, he's making a comparison here in Ephesians. And let's turn to Ephesians 5 and start in verse 25. And we'll go through some verses here because he's comparing a, a human man-woman marriage on this earth with the church uh, body of Christ and Christ relationship. That's what he's talking about here. A physical relationship with a spiritual relationship. First of all, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for the church, it says. Now, husbands, love your wives. That is a command of God. And, and as I've said before, God doesn't command the wife to love the husband. He just commands the husband to love the wife. Because God has made the wife in a way that if the husband loves her, then she will automatically love him back. That's, that's basically what it is. But he says husbands love your wife in at least two, three different places in the Bible. But he never does say wives love your husbands. But how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave himself for it. There, there's no greater love than that. But it's the husband's responsibility. Uh, and And... From this, we understand how much Christ loved the church. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. All right, now he's using a metaphor here. The washing of water by the word. Now, it's not talking about a baptism here. It's not talking about anything like that at all. It's talking about the, the word of God. It's talking about... Uh, our relationship with God, and it is cleansed by the washing of the Word. Every day that we get, this is why I recommend us getting into the Bible every day. Because every day we get into the Bible, it's just like us taking a bath and getting clean every day. That's what it's talking about here. Every day, spiritually, we get into the Bible, we get into the Word of God, it cleanses us. It cleanses us spiritually every time by the word, it says, by the Bible, by the word of God. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Such beautiful language here, such beautiful language. Verse 28, back to the men and their wives. So all. So ought men to love their wives, right there it is again, as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. You see that comparison there? Verse 30, for we are members of his body. We're members of the church. We're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. We're totally integrated, totally immersed 
in the body of Christ. That's what it's talking about here. Once we're converted, that is. Verse 31, for this cause, now it's back to the man and the woman, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. That's just natural. And they uh, uh, and, and uh, shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Well, you know that you've been to weddings, and you know whenever the, the, the pastor or whoever it is, or the justice of peace or whatever, pronounces them man and wife, you know, they become one. They're one family. They're one flesh, basically, before God. Uh, you know, this is, I've seen this done uh, at a couple of weddings where the wife will have a, uh, a jar of salt that you can see through. It's red salt. The husband has a jar of blue salt. And then they have an empty jar. And once they're married, they pour the, salt, the salts together. And the red salt goes in and the, white, and, the, and the blue salt goes in. And it mixes and it becomes something different. But then if they would just take it a step further, and most people don't do it this way, but if they would take it a step further and they would add the Holy Spirit as water into that and mix it up, it would become something completely different. And that's what a marriage is. It's something completely different than was not ever there before. And in that same way, we're totally immersed and integrated into Christ or into the body of Christ. And Christ says we're then in his grasp. We're right there in his grasp. And, and then inside, outside that, there's another grasp. That's the Father. We're inside the Son, inside the Father, and around that is that Holy Spirit sealing it up. You know, nobody, nothing. Once you're converted and you're there, nothing is going to ever take you away from God. Nothing. It says, this is a great mystery, verse 32, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You know, mystery is something that, or a secret, is never something that's never been before understood. And Paul's saying something here, it's a completely new concept. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. In uh, in 1 Corinthians 3.16, it says, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the, whole God, the Spirit of God dwells in you? Well, don't you know when it says, Know you not, don't you know? 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. What? Don't you know or know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Don't you know? There it is. It says it right again. And it, it just says it for emphasis. Verse 20. For you are bought with a price. The price of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. And 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. It says, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation, a new being. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In God's eyes, we are a new creature. We are a new creation before him. Uh, God, we're forgiven. We're new, we're new beings. We're new beings. Let's read Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Things. You know, a lot of us have a lot of things, collect a lot of things, stuff. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, it may be, uh, you know, it may be something that, you know, these, these things that we collect, they're just, they're just temporary. They're just mostly just trinkets. And they spoil after a while, whatever. Maybe just for instance, let's say you, you've always wanted a new pickup truck, four-wheel drive, all the bells and whistles, but you can't afford it. Well, you work for 10 years, and you anticipate that new pickup truck. Ah, one day you get it, and you love it, and you drive it, and in a year or two, and you enjoy it. Then in a year or two, you're starting to get let down because what? It wears out. It wears out. It rusts. It breaks down. <laughs> it's just the way things are. But so you're kind of disappointed. But if we look to God and anticipate what God has in store for us in eternity, we will be under anticipating. We will never be let down. We will never be let down. 
Finishing out here, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ is in, who is in our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. You know, when Jesus appears, we will be with him in glory. Thank you so very much for joining me today. Write to me. The address is on the screen here. Thank you so very much. Mm-hmm.